just with daily effects. Today is Wednesday, excuse me, Thursday, January 26, 2017. Uh, here to take you through this week's weekly Central Bank Outlook webinar. Before we get started, if I could just get a quick confirmation that audio and video are now working. I type a wire, yes, in the chat box. Give me the heads up so we can begin. Wonderful, wonderful. All right, we're good here to go. As always, if you have any comments or questions, put them in the chat box at any point in time. I encourage you to do so. Mainly, this is about you, really, not about me. I'm trying to, here to help you with your trading. Um, obviously, if you're looking for trade-specific insight, I need your entry stop and time frame. I want to know where you've gotten into the market, where your risk lies, and of course, what your point of view is. I'm a swing trader. I operate on four-hour and daily charts for the most part. So. Uh, if you are a scalper, for example, help me help you by providing a little bit more color or detail to your trade so I can adjust my analytical framework. Not a one-size-fits-all approach, obviously, and I think it's important to recognize that. So, um, again, if you want some trade feedback, you need to know the specifics, entry, stop, and time frame. Beyond that, please be aware that any opinion I disseminate is mine and mine alone and does not constitute trade advice on behalf of Daily Effects or IG Markets, so please don't treat it as such. Uh, that said, looking forward to another productive session here. and. This week, we turn to the calendar, actually. You can see that there weren't any central banks uh, meeting this week. So in terms of looking for a specific catalyst here in the near term, that's not really what we're looking for we're going to talk about today. Instead, it's going to be more of a general overview of what to expect going forward, because when we start to uh, turn the calendar going forward, we enter into the period where we start to see more central banks appear. Um, next week, for example, if we were to just flip this over to a weekly view and then go over to filters, just leave on the high events. You can see that on Tuesday next week, Monday night in New York, Tuesday night GMT, we're going to have the BOJ meeting announcing their short-term policy rate. Then on Wednesday, the Fed is meeting on the 1st of February for their rate decision, the first one this year. Thursday, BOE. So there are a few events coming up. In terms of what's most important right now, I have to say I think we should take a look at what the Bank of Japan is doing. Um, we've heard some commentary from various officials the last few days that they were suggesting that the yen could weaken again. You know, when these policy officials come out and say, yeah, we could see dollar yen trading near 120, it's implicitly saying that's where they want it to trade. And so having seen those comments emerge overnight, perhaps this is contributing to dollar-yen's rally. Now, one thing to keep in mind, and this is a very important point about BOJ policy right now, is that their goal is not necessarily just to keep rates low, but they're trying to keep the yield curve depressed, keep that 10-year yield below 0%, so as to deter speculators and foreign investors from using the yen as a, a, a safety vehicle. Uh, essentially, they want to keep the yen weak, in order to keep Japanese manufacturers competitive. Uh, this is a really big deal for Japan. If you look at CNY, JPY, the Chinese Yuan, Japanese Yen exchange rate, you could see how violently this has moved just over the last five years, from the beginning of 2012 until mid-2015, and then uh, really it loses basically, uh, we'll call it 25% of its value. This has a real impact on trade between the two countries, and more importantly, it has a real impact on preferences for around the world. China is one of the world's largest economies, the second largest one, and it, there's data that shows that as Chinese exports grow, the world tends to grow as well. So the fact that for a period there through 2014 and 2015, the yuan was strengthening so quickly against the yen was really weighing on global growth. Now the question is, are Japanese policymakers comfortable with what's been going on considering that we've seen a Chinese policymakers talk down the value of their currency and attempt to weaken it considerably, and b, and perhaps more importantly, do Japanese policymakers feel the need to intervene in markets going forward given what the Fed may be doing? Now, I would think that if we go to perhaps the best proxy for U.S. policy in the short term, 
U.S. short-term yields, the, the two-year yield, if you will, actually. I'm keeping an eye on this because it looks like it may be starting to run higher. Now, in an environment where U.S. yields are being lifted, that should serve to help dollar-yen. FX rates traditionally, historically, move around interest rate differentials. If you actually look through theoretical uh, academic work on how to value exchange rates, it's all based on relationships between inflation rates and interest rates. And uh, you know, you can look up. I'm not going to go into the detail and the, the mess about this, but if you have some time, look up covered interest rate parity, uncovered interest rate parity, international Fisher uh, effect. You'll see that one of the most important facets of FX markets is the fact that currencies are basically ratios. It's not like a stock or a bond where there's a free cash flow or a dividend that you can use to create a valuation. Exchange rates are merely relative bases between two different economies. And so that difference is historically, until real, recently, in really about 2008, those differences, what drove FX markets, were interest rate differentials. And for years, QE distorted that. Low interest rates from the US, from Bank of England, from Japan, from ECB. There was a lot of compression in yield. So on a relative basis, the interest rate differentials were very small. They didn't really matter all that much. But in an environment where the BOJ is keeping its yield curve flattened, tending to keep the 10-year yield below 0%, in a world where the ECB is now buying bonds at any price with maturities as low as one year, these central banks are attempting to keep their, their currency's yield appeal, if you will, low. And so in an environment where the US dollar is seeing that short-term US Treasury yields are going up, while these other central banks are taking measures to depress or suppress their yield curves, that means that the dollar should perform better against these particular currencies. So the fact that U.S. yields are rising, again, I think Japanese policymakers will be particularly happy with. Um, a simple test of this, you can just throw a quick dollar yen. Right. It was really since the end of, say, September, October, once the election comes into play, this really starts to pick up. I'm going to make this thicker. All right. You can see how dollar yen has been tracking this two-year yield here. I don't have the differential up, unfortunately. You can see how this is tracking this two-year yield here right now. Uh, this is really the case where a lot of the yen crosses with this interest rate differential. Um, would be, and I think that the yen is taking cues from what's going on in U.S. yields. So if you look at other currencies, pound yen, if you look at euro yen, if you look at Aussie yen, all of them are kind of telling a similar story with respect to the yen. And the fact of the matter is, is that in an environment where U.S. yields are rising, it's going to take a lot of appeal away from the Japanese yen. That should actually serve to keep the BOJ on the sideline. There's no immediate need for them to go ahead and say, yeah, we're going to ease more. We're going to loosen policy further. We're going to do this or that. They just changed their policy in September. I would think that they're going to be patient for the near term, particularly as the yen has come off a little bit over the last few months. But it's something certainly to watch for and keep an eye on, and we don't need this here anymore. For me in the near term, as we're going into the end of this week and the beginning of next, dollar yen is starting to congest itself or consolidate into a little bit of a triangle down here, which means opportunity is afoot. And I say that because when we look at price action starting to funnel down into a very organized fashion, when we look at what's going on in the yield environment, look at the technicals here, all right, depending upon how you measure it, if you want to be a little bit more liberal or if you want to be a little bit more conservative, depending upon who you are, there's still a mindset here where it looks like this could simply just be a little bit of a wedge. Yes, we had a breakdown of this initial triangle, but a falling wedge here in context of rising yields would more or less say the pattern of a bullish reversal lines up with this idea that U.S. yields could be heading higher. 
Right? And this isn't a perfectly drawn triangle, admittedly. In fact, I would argue now that after several days of development, this is probably more of just a flag. All right. So for dollar yen in the near term, for any of these yen crosses in the near term, that's what I'd be looking to. What particularly piques my interest is that in an environment where U.S. yields are going up, an environment where U.S. equities are going up, S&P 500 touched over 2,300 overnight. The yen is typically seen as a safe haven. If yields are going up and equities are going up, then there's really no need for the yen. If yields are going up alongside equities, that means there's a risk appetite flourishing in the market. I think that despite the fact that we're at near-term resistance levels, Aussie yen and Kiwi yen need to be on everyone's radar. We're at very important decision points in these markets, and when we look into the BOJ meeting next week, I can't help but feel that these two currencies may be more active than dollar yen is. And I know this isn't great or clean because we only have two touches, but across these yen pairs, it sort of feels like price is starting to funnel, consolidate. And given the context of the moves, let's remove some of these lines here. This looks a little ridiculous. All right. This could be a cup and handle, cup, this is your handle, break out, very similar story is in Kiwi Yen, former support, right around that 83.60 area, 83.20, becomes resistance numerous times, cup, potential handle, momentum here is strong, price holding above, all the moving averages right now, indicators have turned higher. So think about this. Well, last time we were at this price, I'm just going to throw down a, a line mark here. Last time we were at this price, these are where the indicators were. Now look, after a period of congestion and moving sideways for a while, we're no longer overbought. The market has worked through its extreme positioning, if you will, on, in terms of near-term momentum. I think this bodes well when you look around. When the market reaches that, has previously reached these levels and went to overbought or oversold, say, in Aussie and even, it produced the turns. This time, however, is different. You can see here that instead of collapsing away, we're holding up. So I think that there's some significant potential there. Across these yen crosses looking to the BOJ next week, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. I'd be very mindful. Uh, I wouldn't pre-commit to anything ahead of time because, you know what, just looking at Kiwi yen, this could be another resistance level. I'd prefer to wait to see if we get some topping price action like we did previously here, a little bit of a morning or some evening star candle cluster. I, I want to look for a bearish development up here to tell me, you know what, maybe the market doesn't want to break above it. I can set my stop on the other side, take a 50 pip risk, and, and look for a deeper pullback. Something that's important to the yen is going to be what's going on in gold. And I say that because gold and U.S. yields have moved inversely. I think the important point to recognize here is that, let me just toss this here. So we know what the yen looks like next to those U.S. yields. Unfortunately, I can't flip the yields, but What I can do is I can line up the yen next to gold. And yen and gold have been trading together since really the beginning of 2016. At the end of January 2016, the BOJ made that announcement. Oh, that BOJ announcement. 
Corona comes out and Japanese parliament says, we're not going to do anything. Eight days later, they come out and they cut rates into negative territory. I mean, if you wonder why politicians and policymakers have no credibility, just flat out lie. But from the yen's perspective, that was a significant development because it meant that on a relative basis, the differential, the carrying cost between gold and yen shrunk. As those differences narrow, they become more and more alike, similar to a, a brother currency, if you will, a sister currency. The average cost of carry for gold over the last 25 years is about 2.4% per year due to inflation, basically. So if you're in an environment where the yen's going to be strengthening, gold's probably going to do well. If you're in an environment where the yen's weakening, gold's probably not going to do well. Simple as that. Um, yesterday in the webinar, in our weekly trading q and I don't know if anyone was there, something that we were talking about was, all right, well, we got the move up into our 1200, 1210 area, and we started to move sideways for the next few days. What's the plan? Well, a sideways consolidation is wonderful for a neutral trader who's not in the market or someone who's just been in the market, aka it's a great pattern for everyone, in my opinion. Why is that? Well, there's opportunity. One thing that we had pointed out was during this consolidation, we had carved out highs on a closing basis and lows right around that 1218 to, we'll call it 1195 area. So roughly, we're talking, you know, 25 points. That was a pretty clearly defined range. And the fact that now we're breaking out below it, we're losing this uptrend. The short-term momentum indicator, this eight daily EMA, it has been lost. We didn't close below it since December 27th. And yesterday was the first close below that line since December 27th. Here we are today now losing this range. That's another piece of evidence to suggest that, you know, one of the anti-dollars, if you will, is due for more weakness. And if that's the case, then you know it. That should probably be good for the greenback overall. When we look into next week's Fed meeting, we've seen that the U.S. dollar has retraced a little bit. In fact, it's retraced back to the point where we're now flirting with closing this week in, in that consolidation range that we saw starting from 2015. Now, on a technical basis, I think that would be a pretty significant development because when we see these false breakouts, uh, a move outside the range, return into it, it typically means you're going to see a reversal within the entire range itself. If we find ourselves closing below 100.25 this week, don't surprise. Uh, don't find me colored surprised if we see price trading back down near 96 over the coming months. You know, an example of what a breakout's supposed to look like, if you will. This is a perfect example here. Triangle consolidation. When we finally do get the breakout, what happens? Our retest is a retest right exactly to that trend line, and then we bounce. What happens here? We break out of this consolidation, we retest the breakout level, and we bounce. If we don't hold up here again, this looks like an abject failure. So the FOMC has a pretty sizable task out of it. Now, part of the reason why the dollar's been weakening has been that fiscal authorities have talked down the dollar. President Trump himself has said that he's not fond of the strong dollar, that it hurts our manufacturers and our competitiveness, which is not exactly untrue. But this idea that the dollar is going to no longer going to be, or rather, this idea that the Treasury is no longer going to foster a strong dollar policy would represent a significant shift in the way the world views U.S. capital markets since the 1990s. Robert Rubin, I believe it was 1995 or 96, the then U.S. Treasury Secretary, uh, proclaimed that a strong dollar was good for the U.S., good for the world. But really what that meant was that the U.S. government was declaring foreign investors, if you put your money in U.S. dollars, you're not going to intervene. We will not do something randomly to undercut the value of your investments here. It is safe. It is stable. You won't see us mess with your markets. Now, the Fed's a whole different story, but from the Treasury coming out and saying that they're basically going to sit on the sidelines. They're going to enjoy the strong dollar policy because it gives the dollar status of the world reserve currency. 
that's been a really important tenant. So by taking that strong dollar policy off the table, all of a sudden you open up this new potential risk, this new variable into the equation, which is for the first time in almost 30 years, will U.S. fiscal authorities use their position to attempt to control or weaken or intervene in the greenback? That to me is something that should be watched for. But the thing that the FOMC will be looking for next week and something we want to hear them articulate is how they feel about fiscal stimulus or tax reform and how that might impact their forecasts going forward. I think ultimately with the labor market tight, 4.8% unemployment rate, jobs growth above the break-even rate of 122K, it's per the Atlanta Fed GDP, or excuse me, the Atlanta Fed jobs calculator. This is already a backdrop in which we should see inflation rise. We should see wage pressures go up. And given the fact that the Fed's forecasts coming into the end of 2016 were based primarily on this idea that there would still be gridlock in Washington, that you'd see a President Clinton most likely, and you'd see a Republican Senate and a Republican House. And so therefore there'd be no significant changes in fiscal policy. The Fed felt like it was going to be appropriate to raise rates two to three times perhaps this year. Now with Trump as President, Republicans controlling the entire government, the odds of deficit spending going up are high, as well as tax reform being passed through. Tax reform is fairly substantive because you could see a tax holiday declared in which foreign companies are allowed to repatriate their earnings that are stashed abroad to the United States. If you've got $100 billion, $200 billion coming back to the U.S., that would support the dollar. This idea of a border tax adjustment is something that theoretically in textbooks, if it were to recur, should support the dollar. However, theory and actuality are, and reality are totally different. We know that markets don't move based on what happens. They move based on what happens relative to their prior understanding. If something's good but they were expecting something great, they're going to be disappointed. If you're expecting something terrible and you only get something bad, you're going to be probably pretty happy. You know, if you're saying, what do you mean, Chris? Well, imagine you're expecting 300K NFP print and you only get 250. Imagine you're expecting a negative 200 NFP print and you only got minus 50. The economy's slowing down, jobs are being lost, but not at the pace that we thought, so it's not as bad as it is out there. Oh, phew. All right, well, we're expecting 300K jobs, we only got 50K jobs. Oh, well, the economy's growing, but it's not growing as fast as we thought. It's all about that relativity. So for FOMC next week, because there are no staff economic projections, or excuse me, summary of economic projections as they call them, both the ECB and Fed have these uh, SEPs, but of course the acronyms mean different things. The Fed's not releasing new forecasts next week. There's going to be no update to its dot plot. And so I think the bar for the Fed to raise rates again would be very, very high. They have a high burden of proof. Instead, if the Fed's going to change policy, then it's going to be at one of those meetings where they can go to the market and say, hey, we're raising rates because of reasons X, Y, and Z. We think inflation's going to be higher. We think growth will be faster. We think wage growth is picking up. Without that justification in hand, central banks all around the world have become too scared to do anything. ECB, BOE, RBNZ, Fed. No one likes to act without a reason to do so. They don't want to lose trust with the market. And by outlining clear scenarios in which they would raise rates or not raise rates, and providing evidence for which why they have done so, markets don't feel like they're being cahooled by central banks anymore. In an effort to become transparent, they become predictable, to be honest. So I wouldn't expect anything from the Fed next week. Look for them to start talking about looking for more certainty around fiscal plans. Ultimately, again, two-year yield is going to be where the juice is to be squeezed. Uh, with respect to the Bank of England, I think this is going to be even less of an event. 
Uh, today we're seeing a turnaround in price. GDP this morning was a touch better than expected, but you know nothing crazy. The one thing that we pointed out in this morning's webinar was that U.S. consumers, while powering ahead, were actually you know there's evidence over a longer period of time that they're not doing so healthy. They're losing purchasing power, and if that's the case, that means the U.K. is likely going to struggle down the line. Now markets don't like uncertainty and the fact that there's now a negotiating window in which Parliament needs to find a minimal plan in order to ratify the vote from June 23rd so that Theresa May can trigger Article 50, that's a complex situation. I think that the pound right here, generally speaking, has enjoyed what's been a sizable bounce on the recalibration of expectations around Brexit. I know going into the middle of January, everyone was saying, oh, we're going to get a hard Brexit, hard Brexit. Theresa May's speech here says that Parliament's going to be included, and then finally we hear on Tuesday that from the Supreme Court that no, Parliament has to be included. That's a really important facet of this whole conversation. A non-binding referendum means it's not, it doesn't have any legal ground. It's just like an opinion poll, basically. An official opinion poll conducted by conducted by the government. The only way that opinion poll can become actual laws if it's ratified by Parliament. This was not ratified by Parliament yet, which is why since June we've been saying, hey, even if you know they vote for Brexit, we don't know what it's going to look like because who knows if Parliament's going to ratify it. Now, I think at this time, given what's occurred and what we've seen develop over the last few months, it'd be political suicide in the UK to vote against your constituents' wishes. And I think that'd be very short-sighted and a career killer. I think that politicians being the self-interested creatures that they are, are probably not going to do something that forces them to lose a job. So what does this all mean? Well, if they're going to go for Brexit then, if 75% of members of parliament ahead of the vote in June were actually for remaining, I would be very biased to think that Parliament is going to try to make this as soft of a landing as possible, which is why I think we can look back with hindsight and say, why did the pound rally around these, the Theresa May speech around the UK Supreme Court hearing results? Well, it's simple. The group of people now who have their hand on the steering wheel don't want to get off the highway yet, right? Theresa May and co. are trying to take the nearest exit ramp to get out of the EU, whereas the remainers, the members of Parliament, 75% of them are saying, you know, we could try to find a different plan. Let's keep driving for a little while longer. So figure if Brexit's going to be soft, pounds, a lot of the pound weakness is overdone. Uh, where would I be looking to around this BOE? You know, we're not going to see, um, I think, things of much significance, although it is the quarterly inflation report. The BOE does release uh, inflation and growth outlook once a quarter, February, May, August, and November. We will have new projections from the BOE. So obviously, there's going to be a close scrutinization of what the BOE feels about the impact of Brexit. In particular, Carney and co. have said that the impact has been less negative than they thought, which implicitly means if they still feel that way, then they may not be as dovish going forward. If they're not as dovish going forward, then it's more scope for the pound to rally. Um, with pound dollar here, just given the overall negative structure, yes, I see that potential for pound dollar base. I think the pound dollar may be basing in the near term, but I would not be looking higher than 127.90 at all. You have the swing a little there from uh, that's July 5th. I need to put on my glasses. July 5th, 2016, the swing high from December 6th. Price is still governed by this longer term downtrend. It's not an appealing environment to try to just haphazardly call the low 600, 700 pips from the actual low in price. So um, I would look to see if pound dollar can rally up towards what 127.90 figure, provide an opportunity to short against it. I think that's fairly interesting because if we're wrong, we'll know right away. We'll have broken the most recent swing here, and then we would have established a period of higher highs and, relatively speaking, higher lows. In an environment, though, where U.S. yields are rising, pound yen is more appealing than pound dollar for what it's worth, and you can see your pound yen is still up on the day. Again, I think the yen is 
at the center of a lot of this weakness. Um, speaking of border adjustment tax, do we think that could see dollar CAD push up into the 140s this year? I'm just paraphrasing your question, uh, not trying to discredit you. So the border adjustment tax is a fairly interesting concept. The theory behind it is if you kill taxes on uh, exports abroad and you levy 20% tax, let's say, against imports, you'll have incentivized American manufacturers to keep production at home, A, but B, um, for investors to keep more capital in the United States. So the hope is that this would lead to a one-time adjustment in the dollar, where now, instead of seeing a tax on the export and or, or, and then you know, nothing on the import there, maybe flipped. The theory, the financial theory, without going into too much detail and boring everyone, because that's what we're here for, this isn't a classroom, is that there will be a 15% adjustment or so higher in the dollar immediately to compensate for the change in trade tax structure. Now, it's always been interesting to me that as dollar max, dollar peso has run higher, Canadian dollar has kind of just been doing its own thing. Both of these are NAFTA partners, and it looks like NAFTA is going to renegotiation. So you'd think that a significant change in U.S. trade policy would have an impact on the Canadian dollar like the Mexican peso. Now, I know people are saying, well, well, he's not targeting Canada like he's targeting Mexico. This is my quip, and I've said this for a long time, and I maintain this as what I feel to be an impartial observer. I don't think President Trump knows what he's talking about at all, period, full stop. You can't levy a border adjustment tax on just one country. It's not how it works. You have to levy them against all countries. So the fact that the Mexican peso has been under a great deal of pressure recently and dollar CAD is more or less distance itself. That says to me that the Canadian dollar could play a little bit of catch-up. And then when I look at something like, let me pull this up here. One second. Right, when I pull this up here and I look at U.S.-Canadian two-year yield spread versus dollar CAD, the yield spread is much higher than where dollar CAD is actually trading, so merely a compression of that to me says dollar CAD has a lot of reasons where we may want to be looking higher. Um, people are saying how come Mexican peso turned around after yesterday, the border, the wall announcement. There was a report by, I think it was Sanford Bernstein a few months ago, or Oppenheimer, I'm not sure, that was outlining, okay, well, if President-elect Trump wants to go ahead and build the wall where are we going to get those materials from? And the fact of the matter is that most of the material, most of the equipment, most of the labor would come from Mexico itself. There just aren't enough concrete plants and uh, foundries along the border of the United States in order to provide the concrete and steel and what, you, what have you to build the wall. Most of the work would be done by Mexican companies, which means the United States government would have to send payments to those companies. It would actually be a big cash transfer from the U.S. to, to Mexico, essentially, initially. Everyone says, oh, Mexico's going to pay for it. Okay, good luck. A border adjustment tax applies to everyone. It does not apply just to one country. And slapping on a tariff haphazardly to one country with that reason might be in violation of WTO trade laws, which means the U.S. could be brought to an international arbitrator for settlement. So I'm, I'm very careful about overcommitting to an idea during this Trump era, because I don't think that the, there's the complex understanding of the issues necessary to uh, properly articulate what his view is. I understand what he's trying to do. I think that the way he's going about articulating what he wants to do is 
a little bit confusing, which is why markets have been a little bit more volatile. Uh, seeing a question here. So among the central bank meetings next week, which would be your favorite pair to trade? Okay, well, just given the fact that the BOJ and the Fed are unlikely from my vantage point to do anything significant, and whereas the BOE is releasing its new staff projections for growth and inflation, I would think that the BOE has more potential out of it. And so to me, that means that pound yen in this environment where yields are starting to rise again becomes fairly interesting. We broke out of this downtrend, going back to the highs we had in November 2015. Once we, and let me take a step back because I want to provide some context why this could be a reversal. So we have this downtrend, right? We start funneling into this triangle after Brexit. We make a break below the triangle, and then oop, we get back into it. So congestion pattern, consolidation, breakout, return into the pattern. What did we say earlier? When you see a false breakout, you typically see a reversal within the entire pattern itself. Return to resistance highs right away. Then we return to the prior swing high. And this to me was very important. We break first resistance at the former high. We break through. We land right back on the other side of that trend line. And that swing. The fact that we gapped open through there last week and then quickly we took it and then broke the downtrend, these are signs that this is a market that wants to run higher. It is fighting tooth and nail to get up to the top side. And you know what I see here that stochastics are starting to trend higher now, not quite to 50, but MACD is now above the zero line, price is above the short term moving averages. Pound Yen to me is perhaps the most interesting pair to next week. And I'd be looking for 145, 45, 147, 75 initially to the top side. On the downside, if we get down below 138, excuse me, 142, 25, 20 over the coming days, that would be a sign that maybe this is petering out. It's always best a contingency plan, right? Everyone says if you don't have a plan, I want your plan B. Okay, well, what about plan C, D, E, and F? If X happens, then we should expect for Y to happen. If A happens, then we should see B. So next week where there's potentially an environment unfolding where U.S. yields are getting ready to run higher again, we see the BOE upgrade its forecast implicitly becoming less dovish. Pound yen seems like it may be eyeing up an opportunity for further rallies. Uh, I did see one question that I didn't get to earlier. Do you use Elliott Wave? I don't. I understand that there are mathematical relationships in the market, but I also think it's a very subjective type of analysis because you have to choose a starting point for when to begin your wave counts. And that means that you can always find a point where your wave count is going to match up with the market that you're looking at. It takes a real disciplined person to use Elliott Waves without letting their other trading styles or subjective biases come into play. What I do like to look at is candlestick analysis, and that's why I want to end the webinar on this note. Last time we were down at these levels, and we spent some time down here, on December 8th, we put in a key reversal, bullish key reversal. Price move below the prior period low, close above the prior period high, check, check, check. And it looks like we're going to get that here today too, if things were to close as they were now. This candle set a new low relative to yesterday, and right now, if we close through 100.41, we will have marked a key reversal here at support. At support as we're seeing U.S. yields run higher again, potentially flagging to break out. That is the biggest part of what's going on right now. And so I don't think, despite the last weakness the last few days, the dollar index is ready to throw in the towel just yet. So 
stay tuned. Keep an eye on this. Again, next week we have the BOJ, BOE, and uh, FOMC. BOJ and FOMC are regular meetings. BOE is putting out a quarterly inflation report, their staff forecasts. So I think there's going to be good opportunity across the board, no matter where you look. I would be paying particular attention to the yen crosses, though, as these seem to be uh, most fertile ground right now for potentially explosive moves in the near term. All right. Uh, wouldn't that be a contrarian play? Commodity currencies rallying, despite the fact that Trump has said that the miracle of export-fueled growth in Asia is coming to an end. Do you want to say I appreciate your time and attention today? Uh, I see that all the questions have run out, and we are 45 minutes into it, so I need to clear the room and give some time to let the page reset for the next webinar. If you have any other comments or questions, feel free to reach out to me through the Daily FX Real Time News Feed, Stock Twitch, and Twitter at CVECUFX. You can always get there simply by scrolling over News, Real Time News on the top banner in Daily FX. Likewise, check out the calendar, economic calendar here uh, for the coming events over the next few days. I'm going to keep an eye on Kiwi CPI tonight. Um, or rather, that should have been. Let me. Pull this back here. All right, now we have the right day here. I'm going to keep an eye on Japanese CPI tonight. Sorry, I had the wrong day there. Uh, Japanese CPI, expect to take a step back. This could be a real interesting precursor ahead of next week. BOJ has a new batch of disappointing inflation data to work with. That could be something that affects what their meeting does on Tuesday. And the fact that we're taking a step back here, more disinflation, at a time when we saw that energy prices were rising, it has to be a concern for policymakers. So keep an eye on that tonight. That's probably going to be the most important thing to work on. Keep an eye on the U.S. dollar index. It's rallying uh, fairly considerably the last few minutes, at least since we started this webinar. Beyond that, calendar for the uh, webinar schedule is always available on calendars, webinar calendar. That's it for me this week. I'll be back on Monday with the FX Week Ahead reviewing the top event risks for the coming five days and how to trade those events. I'll put these links in the chat box before I close out the webinar. Again, thanks for your time and attention. Good luck trading the rest of today and hopefully talk to you soon.